Wow, what an honor. You're here and it's absolutely thrilling for us. Thank you so much and welcome to Yedi Claudia. Now, um, our subject, extinction. Um, it's, of course, we're also concerned about it. We're losing a lot of things and somehow it feels everything around us is disappearing. But at the same time, something else is happening. Life is going on. And um, are we really going extinct? What's going on with humanity? Or are we developing and evolving in a different way and hanging on to certain things more than ever before? Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. But first, I want to say it's an honor for me to be here. And thank you for inviting me to come. Um, but yes, uh, from what I see and from uh, having started to write about food such a long time ago, I started collecting recipe 60 years ago <laughs> and uh, I can see all the changes that have happened and I have been through the phases where when you traveled you could hardly f find local food anywhere uh, uh, the grand restaurants everywhere had French cuisine and everywhere else well especially when uh, uh, tourism was developing uh, they had a special tourist cuisine that it wasn't much to do with the regions. Or, um, and then I saw, well, uh, lots of things happening. Uh, and then now, and with the Nouvelle Cuisines, uh, first of all, French Nouvelle Cuisine, and then uh, the way all the different countries have adopted their first Italian cuisine, and then uh, Spanish cuisine in particular, which became even much more developed than the French Nouvelle Cuisine. Uh, but the way it encouraged people everywhere to feel free to do what they want, and not only encouraged them to feel free to do what they want, but they had to do uh, uh, different things. Thanks. I mean, because we're now in a culture of innovation, that it's creativity and innovation that is uh, valued more than tradition, for instance. Uh, and, but then, since then, I find that the same people who are the most creative in the way uh, I'm talking about chefs, uh, they all say now, even in Spain where they are, all want to be like Ferran, mm -hmm. but now they all say they're doing uh, what they're inspired by what their parents' cuisine, their grandparents' cuisine, their local produce. And regions, I and their regions. regions. So the yeah. region, in a way I find in Italy, in many countries, people where there was at one time a new cuisine in the always in the restaurant trade um, uh, that people are tied to their cuisine mm. and now there is this phenomenon of of um, people being refugees the whole world seems to have moved uh, uh, my family were uh, they moved in 1956, yeah. and now the whole world has moved. But what is interesting is, uh, of all the things about culture that refugees hang on to, even when they've lost their language and their music and their clothes, food is the thing that it continues to be. And there is something, a very, very beautiful thing that you said was you were really amazed how an essence or a smell of a certain spice yeah. can conjure up a whole civilization. Yeah. And um, your family moved here, I'm um, not sorry, not here of <laughs> course, moved from Egypt to London yeah. as refugees. Yeah. And um, there's a part when you speak about a lot of people were moving through London to go to perhaps United States yeah. or someplace else, and they would all meet in the kitchen. And the most important thing there was to exchange recipes yeah. because it was the best way for these people to remember each other. Yeah. So food has this incredible power connected with memory yeah. and sense of smell. And the best way for people to communicate 
and then to keep on remembering each yeah. other is through recipes yeah. actually that just seems to go on and on and on yeah and i think yes taste taste is the person the most personal of the senses mm. but it's also created by culture and really everybody's comfort foods it has to do with who they are mm. it's to do with uh, what country what ethnicity what religion what place they have in society mm. their upper class or working class it tells you who you are mm. and so it's a very much a personal identity and it's something you don't want to lose mm. Um, I have actually a little surprise for you, um, and it's, we're going to speak about, of course, Syria as well. But before we go on to that, um, about, I think, a year ago, you um, did a little interview with one of our key speakers today, Deniz Alpan, because your grandmother yeah. is from Istanbul, yeah. and uh, she, is, she used to speak Ladino, yeah. and um, I have Sarhan, can we put on the little video so Claudio will see. <laughs> <laughs> Now listen to this. Three of my grandparents came from Aleppo and uh, uh, my father was conceived in Aleppo and he arrived, he was born when they, the family arrived in Egypt. And uh, uh, his grandfather, it means my great grandfather, was the chief rabbi of Aleppo. He was Yeah, he was also in the Gaziantep synagogue. Yeah. Yes, so uh, this amazing yeah. family uh, from yeah. Aleppo and from yeah. Istanbul yeah. going to Egypt yeah. at a time where Cairo was an amazing city, a true yeah. cultural mosaic full yeah. of Greeks, Armenians, Arabs, um, Jews, so yeah. and everybody living in peace and harmony yeah. in a beautiful cosmopolitan yeah. city. And then that changed. Yeah. Uh, and then the yeah. rest of the story is you left for London. Yeah. Um, and now yeah. similar things is happening. So yeah. Yeah. an incredible city Aleppo. like Aleppo yeah. has disappeared yeah. in front of our eyes. Yeah. And um, okay, architecturally, of course, something tremendous is gone. Yeah. But these people are still there. Their culture is in their hearts. Yeah. And they are spreading yeah. all over the world. Yeah. How do you think that incredible culture of Syria will redevelop in, in the universe again? Yeah. How will they continue? Yeah, there'll be a diaspora. Mm -hmm. But I remember when the Lebanese civil war happened and then all the Lebanese restaurants. When I first came to England, I mean, it was more than 60 years ago, mm -hmm. um, uh, then, um, yes, there were no Lebanese restaurants, not mm -hmm. a single one. And then after the civil war, it was full. Uh, but the whole world was full of Lebanese restaurants, and certainly it became the Arab cuisine known abroad. And uh, actually, Syrian food, of course, is similar, but Aleppo cuisine is particular. Mm -hmm. And three of my grandparents came from Aleppo, mm -hmm. and uh, they felt so proud to be from Aleppo. It was their ideal city. But also, they always thought of their food as being the pearl of the Arab kitchen. Mm -hmm. It was the best of the Arab the kitchen. kitchen. And actually, now, I've been in to several events and involved with events mm -hmm. where Syrian refugees are cooking. Because not only it's the thing that uh, they want to keep when they leave as the one thing that really is, uh, gives them comfort, mm -hmm. but it's also the thing that they bring, that they can bring, because food is something that enriches a new country. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see what London has become with all the, mm -hmm. uh, all the immigrants not refugees, uh, what they've brought. And I think now the 
uh, Aleppo people, but all the Syrians mm -hmm. will bring their own kind of food. At one time, uh, nobody was interested in Syria. No restaurant was called Syrian. In, mm -hmm. in, uh, it was all called Lebanese because everybody knew that, uh, you know, if you were called an Iraqi restaurant or Syrian restaurant, people would go. go. And uh, yeah, and when uh, my publishers at one time asked me to do three, three, uh, a book with three countries, and I decided, and I said, well, I might do Syria, Persia, and um, and um, uh, Morocco. Of, uh, and then they said, no, no, we don't want Syria or Persia. Uh, and then I said, well, maybe next year you'll want to do uh, a cookbook of the axis of evil. Mm -hmm. And you know that will be <laughs> because it was the axis Absolutely, of evil. Yeah. Add, uh, add uh, Libya. Yeah. As well. uh -huh. but it actually, yeah. now Syria and Lebanon and uh, Persia are fashionable cuisines. So you never know when fashion comes in. The book Arabesque, um, it's yeah. with Moroccan, Turkish, and, and Lebanese. Lebanese. Yeah. At that time, when you were, you know, publishing Arabesque, was it still difficult, or was it already starting to change? Because I think you did something phenomenal in 1968. I mean. You wrote the book, the book of Middle Eastern food, and it really did change the whole perception of the Middle East, not only food-wise, culturally as well. People saw something, the much wider picture. Uh, so by the time Arabesque yeah. came to the picture with Turkish, Lebanese, and Moroccan, yeah. did it, was it different to? It was. Yeah. And uh, when I was researching the first book, mm -hmm. I started collecting long before, uh, just from the people who were leaving Egypt, but I went on and on researching. But when I told people that's what I was doing, they looked horrified. Yep. First of all, why um, I should be painting? Why am I doing cookbooks? Because writing about food was totally the lowest kind of writing you could do then. Mm -hmm. But when I said it's Middle Eastern, I mean, people would say, is it sheep size and testicles? Yeah. You know, that was the perception. Mm -hmm. And so uh, even at the beginning, people thought it can only be a bit disgusting. Uh, and so, at first, yes, there was no interest, uh, but by the time I was asked to do arabesque, uh, really, it because they wanted to do, because the first book had no photographs, and uh, whereas they wanted to do a, fa a modern, fashionable book, mm -hmm. uh, so that was in big demand at mm -hmm. the time. I also wanted to... Um, ask you that your books, um, they're having this almost encyclopedia-like knowledge because you are interviewing so many people and giving so much true information, the heart of cooking, yet at the very same time there's something incredibly human about the books D because it's their stories, it's the stories of their mothers and their grandmothers yeah. and it's all relates so beautifully in the book and throughout the years you must have interviewed thousands of people yeah. I assume and yet you said to me last night, when you look at those recipes, you remember who gave you that recipe immediately. That person yeah. comes in front yeah. of your eyes. Yeah. That human relation that you have with yeah. the person who yeah. gave you the recipe and the way it's told in the book is something so extraordinary. How yeah. is it possible to do something like that? Yeah. I mean, how do you manage? Well, let's say uh, when I started, it was when the Jews were leaving Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a phenomenon that people who never gave each other recipes because they kept them s uh, preciously in their, jealously in their family, they'd never give it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we were all going to be dispersed all over the the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but in London, suddenly there was a waves and waves of refugees it's arriving. Coming. And it was 
as though desperately people were saying, give me the recipe for the orange cake. Now yeah. it's become very fashionable. Um, the orange cake, your hummus. <laughs> hummus is now in 45% of the <laughs> of the population. It's like the is staple written. of the world by yeah, this time. It's Everybody's in the world. Into, yeah. yeah, I found it in Spain. I found it everywhere. Um, but uh, give me the recipe. Your date preserve. Your thing. I'll never see you again, because we thought we'd never see Egypt again, we'll never see each other again. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be something to remember you by. And so, you know, there was this exchange of recipe, and that's when I started taking down. And then people told me something about how they cooked, uh, how and about their lives. They somehow needed to. So they told me sometimes little stories and little things, and I wrote all that. But somehow this way of researching became my pleasure, mm -hmm. my passion almost. And I kept it up even when I was researching, for instance, when my children left home all together the same day, uh, two to go to for a year in America, one to mm -hmm. go to university, I decided I will go the same day. I was then on my own and I just was going to travel uh, across the Mediterranean, and uh, and that's what I did. But also, it became the way that, for me, I discovered that world, mm. uh, and it became incredibly wonderful that I decided in those days, you know, people weren't researching in those yes. countries, mm -hmm. and so it was an unusual thing to sit down and say, oh be on a bench and I would turn around and say uh, I'm an English journalist uh, because actually um, I wasn't going for a newspaper but eventually I did and I did a television series on the Mediterranean but also uh, for a magazine Sunday Times a series on Italy but I would say I'm researching your food mm -hmm. can you give me tell me what your favorite recipes are and you'd be surprised how Talking about food in many countries opens up to totally. People love talking about it, and that you're interested in their food. I mean, now there is a massive descent on people go to markets, even asking recipes yes. to people. So now it's become such a big uh, industry almost. But at the time. Uh, this thing of finding out about the person, mm. but also at the same time finding out about the country. Why is this recipe here? You know, it's an incredibly fascinating so to me. So actually through the recipes, you can really get um, understand the connection between the yeah. cultures. How, um, uh, for example, you find something in Egypt which you think doesn't exist anywhere else yeah. in the world, and then you see the same type of plant in uh, Cyprus, yeah. and they're cooking with that as yeah. well, and it just goes on and yeah. on. And it's these anthropological roots yeah. and ways, the way they're connecting people and cultures yeah. and civilizations together. Yeah. And all of this story seems to be reflected the best yeah. way in food. Yeah. By, while researching food, we discover yeah. who we are yeah. and where we're coming yeah. from. Um, I also wanted to ask you about, um, in 1968, you wrote this amazing book, and still today, it is the reference, it's considered the reference for Middle Eastern cooking. And now, um, it's going to become a radio series. Yes. <laughs> uh, what, what's that? What's going to happen I know. there? I didn't know, believe you could do uh, a dramatization yeah, of, of a book. book. Of a Cookbook. But yes, they are doing it. <laughs> and uh, somebody, actually a script writer, is writing a script about how the book came about and, and goes through the book. But also, I had to give some information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we did a few interviews. But it's going to be with actors. It's not going to be my voice. And uh, yeah, there'll be my mother, other, some of the people who gave recipes. But it was how it, how it came about and they're doing it in at Easter time. 
And so it's going to be this yeah. coming Easter. Yeah. The radio will program will be a dramatization yeah. of the book of the Middle of, Eastern um, book. It's wonderful. Yeah. And this is something also about acting when we're speaking the subject of extinction. There yeah. you have this. We're saying yeah. we're losing our cultures, but more than ever, yeah. people are hanging on to this yeah. book and making, which is now much more yeah. perhaps easier for people to understand rather yeah. than to read it. A television series maybe later on, yeah. and now first a radio series. So people are in s as much as we see things disappearing, yeah. there is a fight to keep our cultures and to keep yeah. our heritage and yeah. our memories. Perhaps memory yeah. is the correct word yeah. for this. And I suppose it's because in the past, every country, in every country, people cooked, were very happy to cook what their mother cooked. Mm -hmm. They were not trying to do anything else. And now nobody uh, now everybody, nearly everybody in every country, looks at the internet to find a recipe, and so uh, and and uh, now it's so wide open to just about anything, mm -hmm. and also interpretations of every cuisine has been interpreted, reinterpreted, because this thing about newness, yes. uh, the magazines and television, they want people who write for them to do something new, and they ask them, uh, can you do that recipe but different? So this thing about difference and what it is, uh, then somehow there is an interest mm. in what was it once upon a time. Then, now, I don't want to bombard you with all these questions, so I do have one last question, and that is, um, how do you see the responsibility of chefs as far as memory and extinction is concerned because before what how children learn from their mothers and grandmothers now there's of course with the technology coming into yeah. the picture and um, everybody's following all these incredible recipes from chefs yeah. all over the world so um, people in the restaurant industry yeah. um, have a certain responsibility for the continuation of foods in their own regions uh, how do yeah. you think that's looking out I mean do you think that's working out yeah. well uh, I don't have a responsibility. Mm. <laughs> I feel I've done my bit. Yeah, uh, more, more, yes. than, more than no. that, more than that. But I think what I feel, the burden now, because I'm still writing, and I'm writing now a new book on Mediterranean, and uh, first of all, I don't want to repeat myself, and suddenly I s want to do this, and I see it's already in my books. So I, I did so much uh, that it's difficult to find new things. But I am doing all kinds of things, but I too feel that I love what uh, all the young chefs are doing, doing not yeah. all of them, but some of them, <laughs> but also the food writers who are doing, there are some great food writers, writers. and I yeah. think the kind of food is so right for the way we want to eat today, in the way of health and in the way of lightness and in the way we also, uh, in my time, we didn't care too much about what it looked like, you know, it's how it tastes and how it was, uh, but now there is this uh, beauty matters, and so I'm just feeling, what should I be doing? I keep doing it beautiful, but then I keep being drawn to how I saw it. Mm. <laughs> and in my, when I researched, I felt it my duty to record every word that people did, and my job was to make it right, to do it maybe better, or to just that it works beautifully uh, because people just gave recipes without being uh, writers they didn't know how to write a recipe or something but it's not my job anymore i've done it uh, but what is my job now which i find difficult uh, what should i be doing uh, but i go on and on for three years having people for dinner all the time testing new recipes and i still don't know what i should be doing uh, but 
but you are, I think, <laughs> more gorgeous. I think you are just um, stunning in every sense of the world. And um, the way you have gone through the years and still keep going is, I think, an example to the whole universe. Claudia, yeah. we thank you <laughs> so much for coming <laughs> and being you. here with us. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.